Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we're looking at a data set of employee, uh, well it's actually a um, synthetic data set, a fictional data set created by IBM data scientists. Uh, and it's basically uh, a data set of different employees. Each record is an employee uh, and we have different features about the employee. Uh, and then we have the attrition flag, which uh, one means they left the company and zero means they did not. Uh, so we're going to try to use the features to make accurate predictions about whether a, a given employee will leave the company or not. So let's hop into the notebook. Um, I'm going to use NumPy and Pandas for working with the data. Um, then we'll use the train test split function and standard scalar from sklearn uh, for pre-processing. Um, and for our models, I'm going to use a bunch of different classification models today. We have logistic regression, uh, k-nearest neighbors, decision tree, uh, support vector machine, both with a linear kernel and a radial basis function kernel. Um, and then we have a neural network and two ensemble methods, uh, a random forest classifier and gradient boosting classifier. So let's go ahead and import all of that uh, and load in the data using pandas.read CSV. So uh, they do supply a train and test set. I'm only going to use the train set. I'm going to do my own train test split on the data. So uh, let's look at the data set here. Um, we have 35 columns, and this actually goes past. Um, well, actually, I, no, no, I, I did set the. I ma make sure to set max columns to none um, if you have more than 20 columns so that you can view them all at once. Uh, and yeah, so it looks like we have some text columns uh, and a good number of numeric columns. One thing I would like to point out about this data, which is very nice to see, is that all of the ordinal variables, um, like uh, categorical variables that take uh, an order of values, have already been encoded as numbers for us. So we don't have to go and uh, ordinal encode those. However, the remaining text labels, I mean, text uh, values, um, are either in binary columns, meaning there's only two values in the column, or nominal columns, meaning there is no order between uh, the values but there are more than two values in the column. And we can get a little more information on the data with data.info. Uh, and you can see we have 1,058 total entries and uh, the same number non-nulls in every column. So this is, uh, you can see there are no missing values here. Um, we also have eight object columns that we'd like to encode. And just to check that we, and double check that we have no missing values, we can use data.isna uh, which will give the is a matrix where a true represents a missing value and then we can sum that over both axes to get the total number of trues in the, uh, the is a matrix which is none so we have no missing values all right let's start pre-processing so i'm going to create a function uh, pre-process inputs uh, this is a nice way to pre-process without modifying the original data frame so we make this function copy the data frame uh, and then return it. That's all we'll do for now. Uh, we'll store the processed version of the data in X uh, and we'll pass in the unprocessed version data. And so X right now is just a copy of data but it will be the copy that we make changes to. So um, before we do anything, because we have an, a good number of columns here, a really useful way uh, to get a little more insight into uh, the uh, kinds of values in each column is to create a dictionary um, that maps a column name to the length of unique values in the column. So I'm doing x sub column dot unique and take the length for every column in x dot columns. So we can see uh, the number of values in each column. Now for a lot of these numeric uh, variables it doesn't really matter. For example I don't really care how many unique ages we have uh, but for the um, object columns I do care. And the reason I'm not just showing the object columns now uh, is because I'm looking for, um, right off the bat, I'm looking for columns that either only have one value um, or columns that have the maximum number of unique values. What I mean is uh, we have 1,058 rows. If we have a column that has 1,058 unique values, uh, that column is of no use to us because there's no way to draw similarities between training examples. On the other hand, if we have a column with only one value, that column is also of no use to us because there's no way to draw differences between uh, training examples. 
So um, we see we do have some of these. Employee count only has one value. Over 18 only has one value. Standard hours only has one value. Uh, and then on the other hand, it looks like employee number is the only column that has the maximum number of unique values. So we can go ahead and drop all of those columns. So I'm going to drop single value columns and ID columns. Uh, ID meaning they're unique identifiers uh, for the examples. So df equals df.drop. I mean, you can pass in all the column names we like to drop. So it's going to be employee count, uh, employee number. Uh, that we have over 18. Standard hours. And I think that's it, right? One, one, max, one. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So we will drop these from axis one, which is the column axis. Axis equals one. And return it. Uh, so now you'll see those are gone, and if we look at X, uh, we now have 31 columns. So we just dropped those four, uh, and the rest of the columns are useful to us. They all contain some sort of way to uh, make comparisons between the training examples. Now, um, the next thing I'd like to do um, is get the unique values for just the categorical columns, uh, the text columns. Now, the, the reason, uh, well, I, like I said, all of the ordinal columns have already been encoded as numeric, so we know that these are either nominal or binary. And so we just want to see which are which using this. So the only thing we have to change here is instead of seeing uh, the counts for every column, we're just going to see that for uh, x dot select d types object dot columns. So this will get the columns uh, from all the object columns in x. All right, and we can see uh, these are all extremely reasonable numbers uh, for one-hot encoding, which is the typical um, way to encode categorical or nominal features. Um, so I'd like to uh, note that there are two in here that have two values. So these are our binary columns. And the reason you don't want to one-hot encode a binary column for example, uh, to one hot encode, we use pandas.getDummies uh, or some sort of similar function. Uh, this will get the dummy columns for a given categorical column. So if we use business travel, uh, if we want to one hot encode business travel, we do x sub business travel. Uh, and we can see uh, each unique value now has its own column. And a one represents the original value, um, original value of an example. So here we have travel rarely, travel frequently. Here we have a one in travel rarely and a one in travel frequently. Uh, now the issue here is if we use this on a binary column, for example, gender, uh, you can see that they're just, uh, it's like a, um, a reflection of each other. The one is always corresponds to a zero, the zero always corresponds to a one. And so these are um, fully linearly dependent uh, you can actually just do one minus one of them to get the other. Uh, so the, there's by having two of them here, uh, it's offering no additional information. And if you have a lot of columns, this can actually sometimes um, slow down, uh, worsen the performance of your model. So uh, when you're using binary encoding, you just make well, one way to do it would here to uh, do this and then drop one of these columns. That works. Uh, another way is just go in and set male to one, female to zero. You could also do the other way, set female to one, male to zero. Doesn't matter as long as uh, you're using either one of these rep representations here. Uh, so I also want to point out that we can use a prefix in this function to uh, give it, uh, we'll use the same as the column name as the prefix, and that will actually just put gender at the beginning of each column name so that we know where these columns are originally coming from. Okay, so I'll just make a function up here called one hot encode that we'll use. And so what I want this function to do is take in a data frame and a column we like to encode. And I want it to return uh, the processed version of the data frame, fully processed. 
So I'll start by creating a copy um, of DF because I don't want to modify the original. I want to always return a fresh copy. And then I want to create the dummies using pandas duck at dummies. And so we pass in DF sub column as our column. And we'll give it a prefix uh, that will be the same as the column name. So prefix equals column. Uh, then we just take those dummies and we concatenate it on to the df. So df equals pandas doc and cat. And um, we're concatenating df and dummies side by side. So access equals one. And then we'll drop the original column, uh, the categorical column from which we created the dummies. So df equals df dot drop column from access one. And we will return df. So there we go. Uh, this function will now take in a data frame and a column and return the processed data frame. So uh, before we do the one hot encoding, I want to do the binary encoding. So binary encode binary columns. Now there's two of them. Um, now there's a few ways we could do this. We could do this with lam lambda functions. Um, we could do it uh, with dictionaries. Um, or we could do it with dummy columns like I showed before. Uh, we're going to use dictionaries because it's really nice. Panda has a great uh, way to use that. Uh, we basically, and it, it, this, this method doesn't only work for binary columns. You can use this anytime you want to apply uh, ex explicitly uh, defined mappings to values within a column. So uh, to do this, we take the column, which is what well, we have gender and we have over time. And let's just look at what kind of values we have in there. So I want to get the unique values in gender should just be male and female. And we're going to send each one to its own unique integer. So uh, we can do this like this. We take the gender column and we call dot replace on it. And replace uh, allows us to pass in a dictionary with the mappings we'd like. So we're going to send female to zero and male to one. Uh, and that will do it for us. Anytime it sees this string, it will give it the corresponding integer. Um, and then we're just going to save that in the column itself. And we'll do the same thing for the other binary column, which is overtime. So if we look at the unique values in overtime, we have yes and no. So all I'm going to do is change this um, to overtime here, these ones. And then we'll change uh, the no will be 0 and yes will be 1. All right, now if we run this and take a look, uh, you can see gender is now encoded as ones and zeros, and uh, over time should also, yeah, ones and zeros. So binary encoding is done. Now let's do the one hot encoding. So pretty much all of the remaining ca uh, text columns are going to be nominal because I always already ruled out the ordinals, and now we've dealt with the binaries. So if we use um, x dot select d types object. Uh, these are the remaining uh, the remaining uh, categorical columns. Now, uh, I do realize now looking at it, um, business travel could be an ordinal column. So let's look at this. Um, if we look at business travel uh, dot unique. Um, yeah, this could be an ordinal column. We could, uh, there is an order between here. Uh, Non-travel, travel rarely, travel frequently, sort of goes in that order. Uh, so what we can do up here is ordinal encode the business travel column. This is the only one in the data set. Uh, and ordinal encoding can be accomplished in a number of ways as well. Um, but using this replace method works very well as um, on to, uh, as well, uh, in addition to the binaries. So why don't we use this method? Uh, we'll take the business travel column and we'll call dot replace on it. Here we just have to pass in a value for each one of these. Um, so we can set non-travel to zero because that's the lowest. Now when you're doing uh, ordinals, you have to make sure that you use the integers um, in the right order because uh, here we're not just giving them a unique identifiers for the binaries we can switch them back and forth it doesn't matter but for ordinals either it has to go in ascending order or descending order 
um, they have to go in con uh, consecutive order. So then we have uh, travel rarely. That comes after non-travel. We'll set that one to one. And lastly, we have travel frequently, and we'll set that to two. Um, right. So let's set that uh, set the column equal to this, and take a look. Now you can see the unique values are one, zero, one, and two. Um, and if we run this, our business travel should re be removed from our object columns. Um, down here now, you can see we have ones, twos, uh, and zeros in this column. So lastly, we'll do the one hot encoding. So let's look at this. These are the four columns we want to one hot encode. Each one of these uh, is categorical and contains no ordering between the values. Um, I mean, one might argue that maybe you could order these, but I don't think, uh, I don't think it makes much, makes much sense. Um, so let's use these in the one-hot encoding. What I'm going to do is just use a for loop for each column in this list. Uh, so I'll go through and <coughs> put in the quotes correctly. Do from the beginning. All right, there we go. So for each of these, we're going to call our function one hot encode. We always pass in the data frame, and the column is going to be equal to column, whichever one we're iterating through. And we'll store the result in DF. So if we run this now, uh, and we take a look at, well, for example, if we look at the object columns, there are no more object columns. Uh, here, there are no more object columns. And X is now fully numeric, contains 48 columns. And at the end, we have all of our dummy columns on the end. All right, so uh, we're almost ready to start training models on the data. Um, last thing I'd like to do is scale the data. So right now, all the columns take on different ranges of values. And a lot of models prefer when uh, every value takes the same range. Uh, every column takes the same range of values. So before we can scale, we have to split the data frame. So I'm going to split uh, df into x and y to begin, uh, because we don't want to scale y. y is uh, what we're trying to predict. So that's going to be the attrition flag here. Um, and we want to make sure uh, we leave that intact. Um, so we take attrition and just set that in Y. And then X is all the remaining data. X is what we're going to scale. So df.drop attrition from axis 1. Then we'll do our train test split. So I only want to, um, but we're going to use a scalar object from sklearn, um, a standard scalar which will give each column a mean of zero and a variance of one. So it will shift and scale each column so that they all take the same range of values. Um, and the reason uh, we're doing the train test split first is because I only want to fit the scaler to the train set. Um, so the reason I do this is because uh, you sort of want to pretend you don't have access to the test set at the time of pre-processing. So we do our train test split first uh, and we're hopefully going to get back these four new sets of data, X train, X test, Y train, and Y test. These will cor these correspond to the train set and these correspond to the test set. Um, and we can use we can get this easily with the train test split function from sklearn. Uh, so we pass in X and Y, which is what we want to split. Um, and then we pass in the size of our train set, which is going to be 70% of the data, so 0.7. Uh, shuffle equals true by default, but I'm just including it there so we can see. It's going to shuffle the data before it makes the split, uh, which is always a good idea. If you're not using this function, you have to shuffle it manually. Uh, and then we'll include a random state as well to ensure that the shuffle uh, and therefore the split is always made in the same way when running this notebook, so we can reproduce the results afterwards. Once we've created, once we split up the data into these four sets, uh, we're going to scale x. So, like I said, we're going to fit the scalar only to uh, the train set. 
So a scalar is going to be a standard scalar object from sklearn. And we call scalar.fit only on the train set. Uh, then we have, uh, we're going to transform both the train and test sets using scalar.transform. We pass in the train set. Uh, don't worry, I'll change those to x test after I'm done. Um, but I do want to point out that the scalar.transform function returns numpy array. And so we won't be able to see it like a nice data frame anymore. So I'm going to go in and turn it back into a data frame afterwards. Um, and when I do so, I want to keep the indices and column names the same as they were before. So index equals xtrain.index, columns uh, equals xtrain.columns. And then of course on the bottom, I want to turn these all into xtest instead of xtrain. So xtest. And now instead of returning df, I want to return all these four sets of data and get them back over here. And let's take a look at xtrain. Um, they, the values have been scaled. So you can see uh, each column takes a similar range of values. Uh, if we look at the means of each column, they're all very close to zero. And if we look at the variances, they're all very close to one. Um, so they, it has been scaled. And our Y train contains the labels which have not been scaled. So let's start training the models. So uh, I, I showed you we have a whole bunch of different models we're going to use. Uh, and for the sake of time, I'm just going to paste this in. This is a dictionary that maps the name of the model to uh, an instance of the model. And this way, we can fit them all with one for loop uh, and print out messages about them using their names. So for each name and model in models.items, so dot .items um, will pair up the key value pairs into tuples, uh, which we can then iterate through two at a time, like so. And for each one of these pairs, uh, we're going to fit the model to the train set, x train, y train, and we're going to print out a confirmation message that just says the, uh, the name of the model and that it was trained. And there we go. Uh, they've all been trained, and we can get the results. Uh, so for this, all I'm going to do is iterate through again from name and model in models.items. Uh, we're going to print out a message that has the accuracy value for each model. So um, the sklearn models, if they're, classific uh, if they're classifiers, classification models, you can call model.score and pass it the test set uh, in order to get back an accuracy value evaluated on the test set. And so I will print out the name of the model followed by a colon, a space, and then I'll display the accuracy to two decimal places with a percent sign afterwards, and format it using model.score, xtest, ytest, and I'm just going to multiply it by 100 since we're using accuracy values, a percentage. And we can see the results. Um, so this is um, a bit interesting. Um, in the case of large data sets and with really complex patterns, you often get the more complex models performing better. Uh, but in this case, it looks like our simplest model has the highest accuracy. Logistic regression wins by far with an 87% accuracy. Shortly behind it is the support vector machine with a linear kernel, which is also a very simple um, approach. And then all the complex models are actually performing uh, not up to the same standard. Uh, we get roughly about 83% on these random forests with an 81, K nearest neighbors also 81, and our decision tree with the worst performance, 75%. So um, our linear model outperformed all the rest. And I just want to check one thing. Uh, I want to copy this over. I want to see how it performs when we change, uh, when we when we don't encode um, the when we treat the business travel column as a nominal feature. So if we go in here and just one hot encode it instead of ordinal encoding it and go back through and train again, we can compare it. Uh, and it looks like we have a worse performance this way. So it looks like by encoding as an ordinal, this actually did make a difference. So it's important that you um, you encode your, your columns properly if you want to optimize the performance of the model. 
All right, and that will sum up today's video. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.